Welcome to my coach interview with director and Delgado and Lee Pro Academy manager, otherwise known as Johnny Delgado. Welcome, Johnny, and I hope you're well. Well, thank you very much, Jake. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Uh, this interview is all about Johnny's experience and understanding within high performance tennis. I'd like to introduce Johnny before we start. So Johnny is an experienced member of both Living Tennis and the Delgado and Lee Pro Academy, who has worked in a number of different capacities across the tennis industry. Having played tennis internationally as a junior, he went on to work as a coach, managed international players and played a key role in staging a highly successful annual tennis event. He was also a coach on the Wimbledon Junior Tennis Initiative at the All England Lawn Tennis Club. So now it's time for the questions. So the first one, Johnny, is please share with us what high performance means to you. OK, so, well, firstly, th thanks a lot for having me on, Jake. It's, uh, it's good to see that you're doing these things. I'm sure it's going to be really, really good for all the kids and the families that you do show this to. Thank you. Um, so high, high performance tennis. Now, that's a term that it's very individual to the person that listens to it. Um, in in the, the way I look at it, a performance player will be somebody that's playing and competing, um, training and then competing regularly. So um, when I say regularly, they'll be playing... A tournament probably at a minimum around about two tournaments uh, per month on the weekends if they're going to school um so yeah it's it's somebody that's training and, and developing a program um this is just a perform performance tennis training and developing a program to play competitions regularly um now when you go into high performance uh, again the way i would interpret that the way i would look at that is taking that, that competition element and, and expanding it by maybe playing internationally. So somebody that's playing either for their nation or, or representing their country um, or playing at high national events, at, at least. So, so that would be high performance, um, in my view. And, and I think the more people you speak to, the, the more different opinions you'd have on what high performance and performance is. But as a base, you'd be performance would be people that are playing around about two times a week in tournaments, um, at weekends and then high performance are the ones that have really dedicated their career to it and either playing nationally or internationally. Yep. Um, that is a great insight to um, what you believe is high performance. And I think for all the parents, players, you know, at clubs or even academies, it's great to hear um, that sort of definition from someone like you. So um, that's yeah, right. we, we, we did. I mean, I remember working with you a few years ago, Jake, when we were coaching a little bit at, at some of the schools in London. Um, you, 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 you will, you'll come across as tennis coaches and tennis players. You'll come across so many players across your career, so many families. Um, now, the level that people play at, it, it's subjective. So you, 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 might, you may come across people that are, that are very, very good tennis players. I think it's important to understand which kind of pathway players are on. Um, are they on a, a social level of tennis? When I say social level of tennis, they might be playing two or three times a week, or are they dedicating the whole of their the whole of their week um, towards playing tennis? So it's just it's important to know. You know, we, we've done a bit of mixture of, of coaching of, of, of people that that are dedicated towards tournaments and then some that are, that are playing two or three times a week. And that's not to say that the two or three a time a week player isn't a very, very good player, but it's just what, what, the, what, what pathway they're on and where, where they're trying to play. Yeah. I think that's really important, isn't it? Uh, in a player's development. So you don't, um, you know, you control the pressure that you kind of put on the player or the, con the pressure that the parents um, put on, put on the player as well. So I guess it's listening true. to that, you have to be very careful. And again, I'll probably say it many times here, but to hear it from you um, is really important. Yeah. Okay, great start. And this is what it's all about. So the next question I want to ask you, Johnny, is what factors should be considered when choosing an academy for your child or yourself? Because obviously you've been in this industry um, for obviously a long, long time and you are... I'm not that old, Jake. <laughs> No, obviously not that old, but, you know, you've, like I mentioned at the start, you've been in so many capacities of the industry. And of course, you're the director and manager of Living Tennis and Delgado and Lee. So, um, yeah, what are you? What yeah, are you so, 
Um, so, okay, so then you ask which factors people consider now um, if they're looking at an academy. So there would be first first consideration is what age is the player. So the, the, depending on their age and what what their ultimate goals are from tennis, that's when you can start ascertaining what what their what sort of program, what sort of academy they're going to be looking at. So if we just take uh, an example of a ten to fourteen year old junior. Um, at this age, uh, between 10 to 14, they're obviously not going to be doing professional tennis straight away, but they will have already had an, a mindset that, that tennis is the direction that they would like to go. And if they want to be playing, as we said at the beginning, performance tennis. Um, so that it, bearing in mind, if they've made that decision that they want to go down the competitions route and become a performance tennis player, it's then looking at how, how, how much they want to, it's probably the wrong word to use, but how much they want to sacrifice towards their tennis. Um, in terms of reaching that goal. So let's say for the example, because there's so many different areas that people could be directed towards. Let's say, for example, they are wanting to sacrifice um, some, some other areas of their life towards being a tennis player um, at that age. Now the decision will be to look at, a, at an academy. So um, at that age, I think the most important thing, and, and if you kind of ask all of my, my family and, and pretty much everyone I've been involved in, I think the important age between 10 and 14 is that the, the kid, first and foremost, is enjoying tennis. So they're having fun playing. Um, so when you're looking at programs at the different academies around the country, number one, will my child uh, still enjoy their tennis if they come and, and train here? Um, are they going to be getting the most out of themselves kind of every day and enjoying doing it? Um, from 10 to 14, I, I can't really stress enough how much it's important that players are enjoying it at that age. Um, we've seen quite a lot of kids over the years that, that, that can kind of fall out of love with the game by the age of 15 and 16. So our, our main goal is that, that, that they're, you know, that when they get to that 14 year old age, they, they're, they're really hungry for another 10 years in the sport and they're not already burnt out. So, so the enjoyment is super, super important. Um, Obviously, alongside that, it's super important that they're able to develop and, and they think that they can actually progress their career. So, so as long as, so it, it, let's just say you, you found a situation where, yeah, I, I think my child can really enjoy their tennis at this academy. Number two, will they actually progress um, and learn at this academy? So, um, now when I say enjoyment, you'll 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 probably kind of agree with me on this. Is is, is people are actually enjoying their tennis most when they're progressing the most. So if, if we can get to a position where they're enjoying their training, um, but actually learning some really, really good technical stuff at that age, then it's, it's super important. Now, most of the good technical work, if you want to go on to become a tennis player, most of the technical work is done between 10 to 14. So there's not too many technical differences that are made to players. So you need to look at an academy that, okay, can, can this academy between 10 and 14 teach my child um, the correct techniques uh, that, that, that's going to kind of benefit them going forward? So um, you need to look, number one, is my child going to enjoy it there? Number two, uh, is my child going to progress technically and learn everything that they need to do? Now, the way that you'd look into that is, okay, what's the history of the tennis coaches there? What's the history of the, what's the history of, of them actually developing 10 to 14 year old kids? Um, so, so you'd need to look into it. There's it, it, obviously quite a few academies around the country, but you'd need to look into the history of some of the people involved that your child will be having contact with. So, you know, what, what is the coach that we're that, 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 that they're suggesting for me? What experience have they had developing a, 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 a player of the similar age as my child? Um, yeah, so that, that would be the two main things. And then there's obviously important things about who, who what other kids they're going to be sparring against. Um, sometimes in this country we kind of get a bit caught up with the you know it's just all about the coaches the coaches the coaches um, but it's super important who the kids are going to be actually playing against if they join your academy so you, you'll find that a lot of parents ask that, those questions to me when they come in but it's super important because um, as I said if, you, if they're enjoying it and they're getting their technical teachings in uh, most important thing is the hours and hours and hours and hours they're going to be spending playing and hitting balls so as much as a coach can do that, it's important that they play against people of their own age and their peers. So, yeah, it's it's, it's kind of how would my child fit into an existing setup that is here would be my question as a parent. Yep, uh, that is really really good, and it's stuff that me as a player personally, um, you know, thought about as well. 
Um, you know, definitely who who's there, what, what sort of coaches are there as well. But even when like, I was coaching with you guys as well, the whole mm -hmm. like enjoyment and fun thing was like a massive um, like attribute of yours, actually, personally. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was, you know, learning from you, coaching alongside you, it was one of those things that I actually, you know, I brought into my coaching because obviously I, I know it's very, very successful and it works well um, with you. So, yeah, I've definitely taken that board on board as a coach. And um, yeah, those things. Well, are kids, kids, kids learn more if they're enjoying. Right. And, and it's very it's, it's I mean, not to generalize, but you, you can you can have a different kind of outlook of how young boys and young girls train. The young boys will be really, really keen. Generally speaking, this is a very, very general term, but they'll be very, very keen to to compete and play. So they, they'll have a lot of fun just by competing with their mates or competing with the coach. Um, whereas the girls will have a lot of fun actually kind of developing their game or actually kind of working on different areas, but they might not want to compete against their peers at that young age. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just making sure that they're, when they're on court, they want to come back tomorrow and they mm -hmm. want to come back the next day and they're actually challenged. Okay. So it's not just about kind of playing around the world, but it's challenging them so that they're enjoying that challenge. Yep. Cool. Um, some very, very good stuff in there. And I think, like you said, this is a generic kind of um, interview Q&A. So mm -hmm. as many people watching this can gain from it, um, mm -hmm. from someone like yourself. Great. Perfect. Uh, so let's move on to the third question, which is what are the windows of opportunity that exist to maximise learning at the Delgado and Lee Pro Academy? Okay, so yeah, this one, which one of the windows of opportunity? Okay, now we're, we're quite fortunate. I don't know if you mentioned at the beginning, our, our academy at the moment is based at Bisham Abbey National Sports Centre. So we, we are, uh, that's where we've been based since oh, probably about six years now, um, five, six years. Uh, we've been based there. Now, the National Sports Centre, we actually share the facility. It's, it's a, basically, it's an elite performance centre. Obviously, you did your apprenticeship coaching there a few years ago. Um, so we, 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 we share the facility with other national governing bodies. So the, G, the T, Team GB, the rowers and the Olympic athletes train there and live there. Uh, team England hockey train there and obviously the England, England rugby ladies as well. So it's, a, it's an environment when you come in, and this is kind of one of our main, main uh, USPs really, is, is, is whenever you come in through the doors at Bisham Abbey, it's kind of an elite performance in, environment. Um, so what we've tried to do is is to make sure that when people are coming into us, they're aware that this is an elite performance environment and this is a place where they can do some really good learning um, if they want to go, <clears throat> go on to make a, a career in tennis. So um, that, that would be kind of in terms of a windows of opportunity for growth. When a player comes in, if they're with you, you know, if they're, if they're going to be coming four or five times in a week, you know, those four or five windows, when they come into the centre, they're going to experience what it's like to be a professional athlete for that time, for the time that they're there. Um, I think something I kind of linked back to the last question is to make sure that when people are coming in that they, they're developing habits for the rest of their life. Um, so when, when you're coming in from, you know, as we talked before, about 10 to 14, but we also have people up to the age of 23, 24 that are playing professionally. When they come through the doors, it's a professional environment. Um, and, and whatever they do on court or off court, it's an opportunity for them to, to live like a professional while they're training. OK, so some people might only be getting introduced to that by, uh, at the age of 10, 11, 12. And it's kind of in, in, in introducing them to the way of, of, of the way Andy Murray trains, the way Johanna Conta trains, the way that Dan Evans acts on or off court. So it's it's about introducing that experience to players so that they can carry that on throughout their career. So in terms of, the, again, going back to it, the windows of opportunity for growth, it's, it's every single time that you come through the centre doors. Um, and every single time that you step on court, every time that you interact with anyone, it's okay. Well, I'm, I'm here as an athlete, um, and it's for, for every single player, I'm here as a professional athlete because it's you know a lot, a lot of people kind of focus on their their academy programs, what what happens on court. I think it's super important what happens actually off court as well. Um, it's it's having that professionalism whenever you're around the centre. So some of our kids, we've got quite a, we're, we're actually an LTA regional player development centre at the moment. So a lot of our kids that are training some of the younger ones 10 to 14 now for the, when they're having lunch at the center for example if you're having lunch next to 
you look across and you 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 you, you, you live there for a little bit yourself. You, you look across and you've got you know the England rugby team on the, on the next table, or you've got the GB tracksuit sitting next to you, it, and it's just a chance for them to see. Okay, well, how are these people behaving? What are they having for lunch? <laughs> what are they doing for for stretching on uh, out of their session? H- how are people behaving? How are elite athletes behaving off court? Yeah. Um, so it's an opportunity to grow not only on your session, off your session, but just walking around the centre. Mm-hmm. Um, like really, really good stuff there. And it's stuff that you don't normally hear actually that often. And when you were going through uh, that answer, I was, you know, thinking back to when I was there and mm. I was thinking about like the off court stuff, like the food, you know, the things that you're offered to eat there are obviously healthier, you know, they're, specific to athletes because like you said the place is um for that for that level but i obviously not, I know not, I not that not that much fun for people like me that are off court who like a bit of unhealthy stuff but yeah it'd be great for the great for the healthy ones yeah yeah um and yeah obviously all the facilities you know it was when i first went there it was really really eye-opening you know to see the courts um to see the gyms um, you know to see the different gyms actually and obviously to see you know the different food it was you know the mm-hmm. whole place was very very different to maybe what I'd experienced before but obviously a good different because like you said it's how an athlete or as we're talking about high performance athletes um, live live their lives mm-hmm. yeah definitely cool it's uh, a 24-hour job yeah it's a 24-hour job yep yeah. And I guess it's not, yeah, like you said, it's not just about the on-court stuff, but it's the off-court as well. And mm. hopefully, like, people watching this will be able to put a little bit more um, thought into their off-court. Well, we did. Uh, sorry to waffle on. I, I know you've got a number of questions. No, but it's all good. We did, a, we, we did a Q&A actually recently, and now, obviously, because around the country, everyone's locked down, so we've been doing a lot of online stuff with our players. But we did a Q&A recently with uh, Matt Little, who was Andy Murray's fitness trainer for the last 13 years. And one, one of the things that he was talking about was and it was enlightening for some of the kids but I think it's important for everyone really around the country to know is you know just in terms of kind of warming up for a session so when you're getting ready getting prepared for a session we've got players um, and I'm sure there's players around the country around the world who who've got their idea of what they think a professional warm-up looks like um, now it was, it was interesting for Matt Little to come out and say okay well for a practice session for Andy instead of turning up, you know, half an hour early to do a, a session, he's there two and a half hours early for a practice session to get warmed up, stretched, uh, prepared mentally to start his practice session. So if he's, you know, he's starting at 10 o'clock to play, play tennis, he's there 7.30, 7.45, um, which, you know, you, and, and naturally when people <laughs> have got school and other things to consider, it's not easy, but it just shows you the level of, level of commitment uh, and dedication people have when they're looking and that's that's high performance right yeah that's high performance yep. to somebody who's actually giving you know to you know we, we have players and i'm sure there's players around the country as i said who will turn up maybe half an hour before a session do a, do a kind of a what they think is a pretty thorough warm-up when you get a chance to see what the elite elite players are doing that kind of really kind of opens a lot of people's eyes up so um yeah yeah and obviously we can only find this sort of stuff out like me talking to you and obviously you speaking to someone like Matt Little and then obviously all the players, parents, even coaches can then start to use that, um, yeah. you know, in their, in their day-to-day lives. Great. Mm-hmm. Really good stuff. Um, so we'll move on to the next one. And how does the on-court and off-court team make the environment to feel family-like and intense at the same time? Okay, so we've kind of covered a little bit of this already, really. When, when, I, when I say, you know, one of the first things that people look for when they're looking at an academy is that, that will, my, will my child enjoy it? So one of my key outlooks on tennis, again, focusing at 10 to 14 and even 14 to 18 and, and, and on to the seniors, is that players are enjoying themselves on court. Now, what I've would like to see um, is, is that everyone, whenever tennis is an individual sport. Okay. So when you're playing uh, professionally and you're traveling around the world and you're playing tournament, to tournament, tournament, to tournament, you might be losing, well, uh, 32 people in a draw, 31 people will lose every week. So you've got to get used to losing. Um, but if you're kind of traveling from week to week, we, it can become a very lonely individual sport. So what we try to 
create a, a, a Bishop Abbey and with the Delgado and Leap Academy is, is to have a real family feeling. So when anyone comes through the door at Bisham, um, we kind of make it our, our, our mission for them to feel very, very welcome and feel very, very safe. Um, so when they come in, they feel comfortable. So a player comes in and feels comfortable and, and safe and being there, that's when they're going to develop the going to be able to progress the most that is to make sure that it's very very simple stuff but it's stuff that we really believe in very strongly is greeting every single person when they walk through the door so whoever whoever might be coming through the door into our indoor hall we've got four indoor courts whoever comes through the door and on the court has to be greeted by either myself or, or in terms of everybody speaking to everyone um, players center um so it's it's making yourself open to all, all people when they're on the courts um making sure that you know there's no real probably i don't know if it's the same at every center but there's no real hierarchy when you come in I'd like to think um, at, at, at Bisham, you know, we've got, if we've got a player that's playing professionally um, compared to the, the the under 12 kid that comes in three or four times a week, they're both as important when they come through the doors because everybody is trying to do the same thing. They're all trying to come as good as they can. So it's, it's, yeah, it's just like trying to get an environment whereby everyone talks. <laughs> so everyone kind of speaks to each other. Um, if we, we have, I don't know if kind of, we didn't mention it at the beginning, but we have uh, boarding as well on site, which is what you did for, for a little while with the French coach, coach scheme. But we have a number of players that board on site and go to a partner school with us as well. So, so the people are going to be spending a lot of time with each other. If you're full time at the academy, you'll be, you, you, may, you may be boarding on site. So you might be here, you might be at, at Bisham. I feel like I'm there now, but you might be <laughs> at Bisham Sunday night until Saturday lunchtime because you'll be, you'll be training with us the whole time. So you, you're going to be alongside your your peers and the coaching team all day, every day, pretty much. Um, so, it, yeah, we, we eat together, we train together, we go to, well, they, they go to school together. Um, so it's, it, it is a family, you know, it's an extended family is what we have. So, so we want to make sure that, that, that people feel comfortable, feel, people feel happy, people feel like they want to come back the following week. Um, when you have when you have a boarding element, uh, and I, I was I was at a tennis academy when I was quite young and um, 10 years old, I started boarding and it's quite difficult if you're not, you know, for a 10 year old kid to be away from home, it's not for everyone, 11 year old kid, 12 year old kid, 13 year old, whatever age, it's not for everyone to be away from home to be training. So we just want to make sure that absolutely everyone is, you know, comfortable and feeling happy in their environment because that's, that's how they're going to improve the most. Um, is there any chance, just from the start of this question, if you could just talk about the few things that you mentioned just at the start, just because this virtually completely lagged out, um, but it's just the first couple of bits, if that's okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, so repeat the question again. Um, so it was, how does the on-court and off-court team make the environment to feel family-like and intense at the same time? So yeah, it kind of yeah, I kind of went on 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 and on there in terms about the, the coaches and the staff making sure that everyone's feeling comfortable, so that they're, they're feeling that they're, they're communicating regularly. Um, but and again, kind of touched it a little bit earlier on that, that in terms of kind of young boys, they want to be generally speaking, they love to compete. So it's keeping everything very very competitive. So you want to make sure for for a certain age group of young boys that they they they're, they're challenged pretty much daily on on at a, at a competitive level. Um, and then the girls as well, that they've, they've got very, very clear orientated goals um, in terms of what they're doing. So it's, it's challenging people in every single session um, and, it's, and it's making sure that they're enjoying that challenge. Um, but yeah, that, that would be the kind of key thing is just keep people engaged and challenged throughout every single session. There's nothing worse, and you, you will have seen it as well, and as well as I have, is nothing worse than those sessions that kind of drag on and you don't feel like you're working on anything and it feels just like people are hitting balls. Okay. More damage can actually be done, even though you might be playing 150 million hours a week, but if you're not actually working towards a goal, 
and you're not working, and you're not challenging yourself with a competitive element, that, that 140 million hours a week that you do might actually be detrimental to your tennis. So it's, it's, it's being all goal orientated, you know, sort of long term and, 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 and short, short term and long term goals. Um, but just keeping people challenged in every single session so that they know what they're working on and the, and the, and the, and their challenge is the main thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important for when like players go and play out outside of like their coach led sessions as well, because mm -hmm. I know I'm kind of going back to my kind of club environment that I'm at at the moment. But, um, you know, your typical club players will turn up, warm up for maybe 15 minutes and then just play a match. And there's no, you know, there's no real focus on what's going on in that time. It's just, you know, I'm either going to come out with a win or I'm going to lose. So yeah. I guess that kind of links together with, you know, you can go on court and play maybe three times a week and feel like you're maintaining a level. But like you mentioned, you could actually be doing more damage to your mm -hmm. tennis instead mm -hmm. of, you know, making that next, uh, bumping up to that next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's great to relate to, for those guys as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next one, based on your overall experience, what would you say are keys to developing a junior player, such as someone who has the ability to move on to the competition circuit? So again, this is quite an individual one. So this is quite an individual, individual question for depending on, on the development of, of the player. So we've got you know, depending on what pathway the player might be, people are ready to kind of progress throughout their pathway at different stages. Um, so that the, the players might be, you know, you might have a 14 year old who's not competed much, but has actually just spent a lot of time working development and working on the technique of their game. But when they get to 14, 15, they actually need to be exposed a bit more now to, to competitions. Um, so it's, it's about, and I kind of refer to it in the last question, it's about setting some very clear long-term and short-term and long-term goals. Um, now, kind of generally speaking, you know, you want to be making sure that when, as I said, again, about 15, 20 minutes ago, was the, we want to make sure that people are in the sport still when they're 15, 16, 17. Um, I've seen so many over my 30 years plus in this sport of people dropping out of the sport when they're 16, 17, 18. So we want to make sure that people aren't burnt out when they get to 16, 17, 18, and that they're actually ready now for a professional career in the sport for another 10 years. Um, so with that in mind, though, though the, the first section, you know, from I'm going to say the first section, when people like 10 to 14 years of age, you want to be developing their game. You want to be working on things that is going to be beneficial to them. Not now, not now so that they're, 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 they're junior games, but actually developing an adult game for them so that when they get to 15, 16, they can really ramp up their competitions um, and play, get more match practice in so that by the time that again they're 16, 17, 18, they're either ready to play professionally or, or ideally maybe go to American University like your sister. Mm -hmm. um, but it's key that, that they, they, they're getting a lot of match practice in, you know, and again, this is a generalization because everyone's at a different stage of their development. But, you know, 14, 15, 16, that's when you start really ramping up the amount of matches and tournaments that you're playing. Um, and then you're looking to, you know, develop their whole game, their technique, how they how they play the sport earlier on, um, ten to fourteen. Um, but but I can't reiterate enough how important it is that we, you know, you've got people that are ready and ready to go on a 10, 15, 20, 20 year career when they're eighteen. You know, the, the we, we we I've seen a number of examples in this country of 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 you know people probably focusing on the wrong things with a 9, 10, 11, 12. And it's all about winning matches and it's all about getting your ranking to this or getting your rating to this or winning this many matches to get you. And, and kids get burnt out when they're 13, 14. They're like, I don't, you know, it's, it's taking the enjoyment out of it. So it's it's making sure that they're progressing and they're challenged and they're, they're doing enough, but ready. The, the bigger picture needs to come into it so that they're ready when they're, when they're 18, 17, 18. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah, no, because um, yeah, I yeah, I asked what you know what you should be doing, you know, leading up, and then you know in a in a player's development, and then once they're ready to go into competition, what could they what should they be doing before and then leading up? So yeah, no, you've covered it perfectly. Um, just to add on to that, because obviously you mentioned there that you know you don't want to work on like the wrong things or inappropriate things at a certain age. 
there's a big thing that always goes around, especially when I was playing and now I experience it in coaching. But what's your thoughts on like going up in terms of ball colours? Because you sometimes have a really good player at, say, I don't know, orange ball. And they go, right, sometimes they may feel they're too good or they're too strong for the ball or the court itself. And then they want to bump up. What are your thoughts on on ball colours? Um, the... <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really really useful tool for developing people's games. I think what we've we've, we've seen out over the years is people using it towards using it slightly the wrong way and just like you're saying trying to bump through and miss out uh, miss out levels of their de- their development stages of their development. Sorry. So and and this goes across even beyond ball colours, but kind of going through the age groups and then just go and play internationally. You can very rarely miss out stages in a development. I'm not a massive fan of, of, of skipping stages unless it's really, really obvious. So if you're, if you're playing red tournaments, you're winning every single tournament that you're playing in. Uh, and, and we're talking about a competitive element here, so I, don't, I won't talk about kind of training and people moving up yeah. levels and stages in training. But if you're playing red tournaments and you're winning every single tournament and then you're, you're, you're winning every single tournament in the country and national events then you're ready to move up a stage. Um, but it needs to come from actually progressing through that stage yourself. Okay, so it's not, uh, you know, a lot of people may, might not want to spend too much time at an orange ball. Well, if, if your level and, you, and, and your level is, is at that orange ball, you've got to stay there. You've got to, you've got to stay there to make sure that you're, you can't skip levels. And that, as I said, that goes right up where you see people, okay, well, you know, I want to go and play international events. I want to go and do, play, I want to play junior Wimbledon. Well, if you haven't won your, your county level tournaments, and then if you haven't won your regional level tournaments, and you haven't won your national level tournament, then you're not ready to go and do that yet. Yep. So it's important that you kind of just be aware of what is my pathway, like you're saying, the ball colours. Okay, so I'm going to start off with red. Let me conquer that first. Let me try and conquer that level first. Okay, I'm now ready to go onto the orange balls. Let me try and conquer that. If you're losing every single orange tournament you're playing, then let's probably say that you're not ready to move up to your green level tournaments. Um, so it's, it's about, you know, respecting the level that you're at and, and actually trying to conquer that level before you start progressing up a level. Okay. And it's, it's going to be pretty obvious to your coaches. It's going to be pretty obvious to your parents and, and, and the, and the tournament structure once you've actually completed a level. Um, but that, that, that's really important for somebody like yourself and for me to actually educate the parents and the families. What is the, the, the uh, what is the landscape? What does it look like? What do I need to do to progress through the different levels of our sports? Um, you need to be aware of okay, well, it's not just the local club tournament uh, orange event. There's also another uh, orange event five miles up the road. There's also one up up north. There's ones all around the country. So you just need to be aware of the bigger picture. Complete the bigger picture. You know, so playing national events is super important. Um, if you can get up to that level, but you can't be jumping levels until you've computer game once you complete the level. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that you that you basically sum that up as respect the levels um, mm. in, in that way. Yeah, I really like that one. Okay, um, so let's move on to the sixth question, which is: yeah. You've done some great work across the tennis industry. Tell us about how you carved out one of those spaces and where you saw the opportunity. Okay, so um, yeah, for those people that don't know, I mean, yeah, I've done kind of a lot, a lot of, <laughs> over the last over the last thirty odd years, I've done a lot of different things in tennis. Um, you know, I spent a number of years trying to play professionally. Uh, I actually went to American University with a tennis scholarship. Um, I then came back and, and started my tennis coaching career when I was in my early twenties in the UK, um, and then I actually spent a couple of years. Uh, kind of thinking about what I wanted to do as a probably similar sort of age to you actually Jake um what, what I wanted to do in life and what, what, what I wanted to do within tennis and I realized I kind of wanted to do a bit more but I still wanted to be involved in tennis so um I actually moved into sports management um so when, when I say sports management it's kind of working as an agent um got introduced I was actually good friends at the time with uh with Jamie Murray um so Jamie Murray was was, was uh, just starting out his career his professional career I say he was just starting out. I think he just won the mixed doubles at Wimbledon, actually. So he was, yeah, a couple of years younger than me. And I'd known him since, you know, for about 10 years before from junior tennis. So kind of moved into sports management there. 
um, and it was a completely new experience, um, something I hadn't been involved in, but I had to learn pretty quick because, you know, I was spending a bit of time traveling with Jamie and Andy Murray, who were just kind of starting out their professional career. Um, and it was quite, yeah, traveling around with them was, 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 was a real eye opener. Okay. Well, this is what the professional sport was. Um, so what we needed to do, or what I needed to do was I needed to get pretty up to speed of what a elite, 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 top, top world performer does, um, and what they need on and off court. Um, and it was, it was fantastic, really. It was fantastic to kind of learn, not just with them, but some of the other, the, the other players that we managed was, was okay, well, having been involved in sport all my life, you know, actually seeing it up close and personal what a top 50 in the world ATP, play, ATP player does toward their tennis career. Um, yeah, it was completely eye-opening to see, you know, what, what these guys do. So it was um, kind of learning what players are doing on and off court. And this is the whole thing we were talking about before, you know, the preparation for sessions and seeing what they're eating off court, seeing how they're preparing for this, seeing how they're warming down, seeing how much time they're spending on their sports and their trade. And it'll be the same for, for people that listen in that are not even tennis players, but, you know, the, the top, top, top performers in any discipline around the world, how much time they spend on their, on their, uh, on their sport or, or whatever they're working on. It's, it's huge. Um, so and, and yeah I, I kind of thought I'd had an understanding of it before but once you actually see it you kind of start learning more um, so yeah that, that was that, that kind of embarked a whew, six seven year period where I was working with some of the top top players in the world so we had you know uh, tennis players that were I had a girl who was top 20 WTA I had three other guys that were top 50 60 ATP rankings in the world and um, so yeah, it kind of it was a real door opener in the tennis world because you, you you're able to kind of see exactly what's happening at the elite level, um, which then helped me when opening up. We started off living tennis um, a few years later. It just kind of you know it allowed me to have a bit, bit of a better understanding of what the final end goal is because sometimes you know we all kind of work towards creating players or training players up, or, but but there's not so many people that have actually seen what happens day to day uh, on a elite elite level um so yeah that was a really good experience but different to what what i kind of probably expected at your age <laughs> to kind of go yeah. towards mm -hmm. um no what's really good there is obviously you've done a lot and you played to a really high level um etc and then you went into something just recap here that you went into something where you obviously knew an awful lot but you still took that initiative to learn just to get that, um, you know, that higher, that higher level experience to be able to, you know, get the most out of what you're doing. Um, mm. And then just look at all the paths that you've, that you've taken and the experiences that you've got. And now obviously myself listening to this can, you know, kind of plan how I, how I move along. Um, and players, of course. And Look, one of the things people that don't know, so there's, there's three of us brothers so the, that are involved at Delgado and Lee. So there's my brother Jamie and my brother Paul. And one thing that we, we kind of realised five, six years ago, maybe probably a bit longer now, six, seven years ago, was all three of us played, you know, nationally and, you know, top, top in the country for our age groups as, as junior players. But all three of us took different pathways. Um, so... We, we, we found ourselves when, you know, I was late twenties, my brothers were in their thirties, but that we were all, we'd all carved out a career in tennis, um, but had all done it all very, very differently. You know, so the, the good and the beautiful thing about tennis is, is there's so many opportunities to you. People just think about the te playing the tennis or just about playing the tournaments. And we were talking earlier about being an elite performer or a high performance player. Yes, that end goal is is to become Wimbledon champion and be number one in the world. But if you can get up to a really high level in your junior days and, and, and get as far as you can progressing your sport, the, the, the amount of doors that can open, and it, just in my own family, we can see that, 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 that can come from playing tennis and training high, training hard. Um, you know, you can work in tennis tournaments, you can work in sports management, you can work in staging an event. You, Paul could, um, was running a whole, a whole business before development coaching. So, you know, working with the community and doing summer camps, um, doing tennis holidays. My other brother, Jamie, was playing professionally for 25 years. He's now coaching professionally on the tour. So 
all three of us kind of took a slightly different route, but we're here 35 years later, all still being involved in tennis um, and all working in tennis. So it's, it's yeah, it, it can open a lot of doors, tennis. And it's been really good. It can be really, really good to you if, as long as you respect the sport. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I guess lastly, just on this, as a player, um, you know, you see these uh, these examples um, where there's people playing in their, you know, their late 80s and even, hun- you know, there's people that play in their hundreds. So, you know, you can play for that long. Like you said, if you respect, if you respect the game, etc., then you can, you can do so much in this sport. Mm. Yeah, definitely. No, it gives a lot to people. Mm hmm. OK. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Can you describe or give an example of a high performance tennis player's daily schedule? So like one for a school day and then one for a non-school day. Okay, yeah. So so as I said, you kind of a little bit earlier on before we've got we've got boarding on our on our campus. So, so players, if I if I take a kid that's that's maybe for example boarding at the school, we, we, we have a link. So just to kind of give you backtrack a little bit, we have a link with a, a school. Um, a local school that, that uh, is an independent school that our players get a scholarship at if, if they come to our academy um, and they're accepted into the academy. But what they do is they, that actually means is the school allows them quite a lot of time off for training. Um, so we work very closely with the school in terms of their, their, their development. We, we have a weekly meeting with the, with, the, with the player liaison we have at the school is just to make sure that our players that are there, we have 17 kids at the school, I think now, um, and all, all the players are actually keeping up to date with their schoolwork. Well, it's super important that they get an education, as I said before. You want to make sure that you've got your education because there's lots of different pathways that you can do within tennis, but you've got to be um, up to a certain level and educationally. So, yeah, we, we work very closely with the school in terms of allowing them time off throughout your school day. So what that typically would look like, for example, a 13-year-old kid would be, generally speaking, they'll, they're, if they're boarding, well, even if they're not boarding, but they live locally, we'll, we'll have a squad in the morning. So they'll do a, a very early 7 a.m. squad before school. So they'll do a, a 7 to 8.30 tennis squad, um, then go off to school. They might have a few lessons, have two or three lessons. Typically, they'll, they'll then come out. They might come out late morning or during lunch or in the afternoon to train again. So they might do a hour and a half squad or, or maybe even an hour an individual during lunch. Um, then go back to school and then come back, uh, come back to Bisham for around about four o'clock to do a, a fitness session. Um, so they'll do like a 4.30 to 5.30 fitness session. Um, they, they'll try to play two times every day and do two fitnesses every day. And when I say two times, that'll be two hour and a half sessions. So like three hours of tennis per day, um, school, uh, and then two hours of fitness per day. But that, that their day, if they're a full time uh, academy player their day will be finished by 5 30 so when you're again and it's important to know what your pathway what you're trying to get from tennis if you're trying to become a top player in the country or play internationally or make tennis your career you want to make sure that whenever you're on court you're absolutely maximizing in terms of how how fresh you are and how ready you are for, for your sessions so with this schedule that i've just said to you for example where they're coming in and out of school and they've played three hours tennis they've done two hours of fitness and it's only 5 30 at night that gives their evenings for uh, doing their schoolwork that they might need to do now the difference there between generally speaking i'm sure probably at the clubs that you're coaching at and and, and clubs around the country a lot, a lot of the kind of junior players like a 12 13 year old player will play after school and they might do a squad you know five o'clock till 6 30 or 6 30 till 8 p.m or whatever that time might be but but they'll be playing kind of in the evenings now what we found is, you know, it's kids that have got so much on their plate. They've got, you know, they've got schools to think about. They've got a um, homework. They've got to get ready for their GCSEs. They've got this tennis stuff going on as well. If you're tagging your tennis on just at the end of the day, when I say tagging your tennis on at the end of the day, if you're doing a squads kind of evenings at the end of the day, it's difficult for a kid who's just been sitting in, in a classroom all day for eight hours a day to then give their absolute 100% dedicated focus uh, in a session later on in the evening. Um, not to say it can't be done. It just makes it a little bit more difficult for a kid who's been at school since eight o'clock in the morning to be at 7.45. Their coach is saying, why aren't you concentrating on that cross court? Now? I mean, it's, you know, you've got to think, put yourself in the kid's situation. So, um, when we're talking about high performance, you know, if, if, if a player has made the decision that they would like to be a professional tennis player, 
and they want to give, and, you know, the, the coaches suggest that, but they could be a tennis player and the parents do suggest that as well. You know, then you, then they're, they're, what they're saying is they're committing to three hours of tennis a day, every day of the week, five days a week and a Saturday morning as well. Uh, you know, that's quite a big commitment for a, for a 12, 13 year old kid to be playing three hours of tennis every single day, two hours of fitness a day. Now, if we said to them, look, you're doing three hours of tennis and it's going to be five o'clock till 8 p.m. every single night, you've now just made that child's day 12 hours a day of work. Um, they'll be very, very quick to stop the sport. <laughs> um, so so it's about making sure, yeah, so in terms of the schedule, that, that's why we try to, you know, we work closely with the school because we know that the hours that you need to play if you want to be a world-class tennis player, you've got to be doing those hours. You can't get away from it, unfortunately. Um, you have to be playing, you're getting the repetition and the hours and the training in if you want to go up to that that, that international level. So um, that kind of gives you a bit of a schedule of what a under-14 kid program would look like during the day we've then got players that have now left school and they're playing professionally um so you know they might be in the 19s and 20s that again tennis wise they'll be doing very similar they, they'll be playing three to four hours probably a day um again this is all individual on on what 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 that player needs at that part of their career at that part of their their, their development but they'll, they'll be looking to do, train three to four hours a day with two hours of fitness and again that would be in the morning um if they haven't got the the, the added consideration of school, they might do a squad 8.30 till 10 in the morning. Um, then they'll do a fitness session 10 till 11. Then they'll have lunch. Uh, then they'll play maybe 1 till 2.30 in the afternoon on a squad. And then they'll do 2.30 till 3.30 a fitness session. So that means their day is finished at 3.30. Um, but they've done the same sort of stuff as a, as a school kid's done, but the school kid's finishing at 5.30. Um so, yeah, I mean, it's, again, the sport is, as I said, at the very, very, very beginning of this call. You've got to make sure that you're enjoying it, but you also, you know, make, got to get the hours in. So, so that's where if you're not enjoying it, the hours can become tedious. And trust me, I've seen that. If, if, if you're not enjoying this sport and you're doing what you have to do and you're playing that, that amount of tennis, like I just said, and you don't enjoy it, you won't last long um, in this sport. So, so you've got to enjoy it. And I guess that kind of links back to one of the questions I asked you about what to think when you're maybe, you know, sending your child to an academy or thinking about sending it. Because, you know, it sounds sounds like a lot. And obviously there's got to be a lot of dedication and lots of other things. So you've also got to pick the right place to be able to do that at as well. And obviously, because I've experienced coaching at Bisham, Living Tennis, etc., that you guys do an awesome job. You know, it's fun. It's intense at the same time. So, yeah, and that's why, like, my, my early coaching career, I think, was, was, really, was really good because I started with you guys. And, you know, you set the standard and, and you know it's successful. You know it's going to work. Um, so, yeah, really, really good. Good stuff. Okay, um, so we're coming close to the end. We've got about three questions left. So the next one is, what system guarantees the focus on the individual needs of every player um that'll be something i kind of we've probably covered quite a little bit a little bit already um in terms of again they're enjoying it and they're getting all the hours if we kind of take that as a given um every single player that comes through our doors um and i, I know i wouldn't say we're in we're, we're alone in doing this around the country around the world is, is having a very individualised training programme set for them. So although that schedule that we've just said, um, you know, it's pretty set in terms of you've got to get your three hours in a day and you've got to play your two hours, so do two hours of S&C every day. Every kid's going to be slightly different in terms of what their development and, and what their goals are. So, so it's just making sure that every single player that comes in, uh, number one, you know, they're assigned a coach to look after their programme. So, so the, the, they might be having a lot of individual lessons. Some people might be just doing a squad-based program, but it's important that everyone that comes in has got a coach um, and the coaching team that we have that, that's dedicated towards their program. So it's knowing, okay, what my weekly tennis schedule looks like. And you're kind of sitting down with the coach going, this is what you need to be working on. Um, and then what my long and short-term goals are. So that's, that's kind of done at the very beginning when, when you arrive is to make sure, okay, we're all clear. What do you want from your tennis in five years' time? let's all try and work together to, 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 to work towards that. So, so we, we, we actually have like a group chats for every one of our players um, with a WhatsApp, which we have, you know, families on there as well, but the whole coaching team. So, you know, the player got no place to hide really, but um, they'll have, 
you know, everything towards their tennis will be di directed onto those group chats by our head coach, Tom Greenland. Um, and Tom will basically work with the coaching team to make sure that every one of the every one of the players that are coming through the door to our academy is very clear about what their what their individual goals are. Matt Jaggard, who runs our S and C strength and conditioning, he'll be very clear. Okay, well, this is what this is what uh, this player needs to be working on physically um, over the next five six months, and this is how we're going to go about doing it. Um, and he has a very very thorough you know program that, that, that all the players follow. Um, but it's also very important, you know, in terms of the development of the kid. And again, this is kind of a lot of research that Matt, Matt and his team do is, is what are the growth patterns of the child? So, you know, you've got a kid who's going to be having, whose parents are really tall, you know, that there's going to be a growth spurt coming up at, at whatever age. You've got to make sure that you're tailoring your program individually to them. Um, Cause you know, load on, 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 on young players, legs and backs can, can lead to injury. So it's about, it's about making sure that everyone's individualized from a scientific point of view of, of, of what they can and can't do at that age for these next year or two. Um, and also on a tennis point of view, what, what, what we're working towards and uh, people need to be clear um, and know that everyone in the team at Bisham and in part of our academy is, is, is all working towards helping that player individually. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, the key thing is, is, is people are very clear on their goals. Okay. Um, next one. What are the common growth and development stages that affect learning at this level? Kind of link back to the last one, really. Yeah. So if, 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 if you're not spending too much time, uh, kind of, I've touched on it a bit earlier on, if you're, if you're just kind of running, do the standard, getting the hours in, um, more, more damage can be done if you're not clear about what you're doing. So it's about, you know, training intelligently rather than, hours and hours and hours and hours. So it's, um, you, if, if, if you're not setting out a plan of what you're doing, if you're not, uh, you know, individualize, individualize, individualizing your S and C program, strength and conditioning, you're going to get injured. You're going to get kids that are going to pick up injuries because they're not used to load and you haven't thought about it individually. And you're going get to get kids that are just working on completely the wrong things. Um, and when I say the wrong things, but developing a game that's not going to be successful when they're older. Um, so, what individual areas would, would affect that would be, you know, not, not working on your, on, on the individual uh, and, and, you know, just kind of going through the motions, you know, there's a lot of different areas that go into becoming or getting the most out of performance player. Um, and if you dis you know, they're, they're, if you disregard areas, they'll, they're, it catches up with you. It catches up with you eventually. So, you know, I, we've all seen it. I'm sure you have done in the junior tournaments where, where you get a kid who's, exceptional at 10 11 12 um but at 15 16 you don't you don't know what they're up to because they you know they carried on playing as a 10 11 12 year old into their teens um so it's yeah being really really clear okay well what is our end goal is my end goal to be a tennis player when i'm 18 or is my end goal to be a really really good 12 year old player okay and no no answer's wrong or right but we just need to adjust our, our goals towards that yeah uh, you just have to be realistic don't you yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's our job to help them, though, Jake, as well. So it's, it's, it's the job as the coaching team to kind of educate families that might not be aware of what the standards and the goals should look like. Um, you know, and it's 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 the job of coaches and academies and clubs around the country to say, well, look, this is this is the pathway and the, that, that your child is on at the moment, um, and you know, giving them an awareness of standards because a lot of people won't 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 be aware of what's what's out there yeah and I guess just um you know when when players are taking coaching and that sort of thing it's not just coaching them on the court but like you said educating as well as off the court except um for example to the parents um yeah. and making it you know a little bit more of a team kind of thing and like you said having the whatsapp group chats is a is a great example of that mm. cool um so last one can you give any thoughts, comments or advice for players wanting to take their game to this level that are watching this? Um, you probably get bored of me saying it now, but yeah, just, just to keep enjoying it. So to make sure that when you, you yeah, to, to, that, that you're key to, keen to come back is to keep make sure that you're enjoying it every single time. Try to keep it fresh. Um, 
yeah, it, 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 this sport can give so much for 20, 30 years beyond <laughs> 20, 30 years beyond what you think is possible at the moment. So, um, yeah, it, enjoying it. But but if you're really, really keen to kind of really go as far as you can, I'd, I'd try and do as much research as I can and look, look to see what those standards are around the country, around your club, around the world, around around the tennis community. Yep. Um, it's it's be really ready to learn, really. So, you know, so the, the best kids that we have uh, are the ones, might not be the ones that are winning all the matches or might not be the ones that are winning all the tournaments. But for, as a coach, you'll say the same as those ones, that those kids that come in and they're ready and they're coachable and, they're, and they want to learn. So no matter what their level, if, if they're coming through the doors and they're, they're receptive to, to learning, then that kid's going to go far in whatever. So, so be really ready to learn. Be really be a sponge for all information, especially in your junior years. Get, just get out there and, and find out as much as you can. <laughs> Again, going back probably about thirty or something years, but you know, it, when I was in between ten and fourteen, fifteen year, years of age, off court I was obsessed by tennis, absolutely obsessed. So I'd be, you know, off court I was. This is pre-internet days, so we used to have uh, you know magazines that come through. I'd be reading the tennis magazines, going through the tennis rankings, writing all the names down of all the players that are around the world. Hours, hours and hours and hours. I was obsessed by it, but I wanted to know absolutely everything about the tennis world, you know. And it wasn't just about the time I was on court. So I would be, you know, trying to find out as much as I can um, about the, the the career that you might want to be taking. But you, you, yeah. Um, Learn and enjoy it. Yep. Simple. Okay. Mm. Um, good stuff. Well, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you so much for joining me this week on my coach interview, Johnny. Obviously, I couldn't have done it without you. And thank a big you. thank you to you all at home for watching. Be sure to tune in for my next episode. And all the best. Thanks, Jake. And good luck with this um, this series. It's a really good idea. What you've been, I've, been, I've been watching a lot of your online stuff. It's been really good fun. Thank so, yeah, I think you've been doing some really good stuff on social media. So whoever's having letters off Jake, keep listening to him. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers, Jake. All the best.